Hi, and welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show, the show for animal training and behavior nerds, where I, Ryan Cartledge, interview the world's most proficient animal training and behavior geeks. We're absolutely thrilled and grateful to have you here with us today. So make sure you hit that subscribe button on whatever you're listening to this on so that you don't miss a single episode. Each episode of this show is brought to you on behalf of the ATA membership. And if you like the conversations in this episode, then you're invited to continue them with like-minded behavior nerds within the membership area, which you can find out more about at www.animaltrainingacademy.com. You'll get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalog of previous web class replays, plus a huge library of videos and projects to help problem solve your training challenges. Plus, we're a sociable bunch with an exclusive private Facebook group and forum areas. It's like a Netflix social media platform for animal behavior geeks. But we will start today's episode where we are very excited to welcome back to the show one Nicole Lowbury de Bruin. Nicole has been a veterinarian since the late 1980s and has worked exclusively on companion animal behaviour since 2016. She is a member of the ANZCVS, Australian New Zealand College of Veterinary Science in Veterinary Behaviour, and operates a private practice animal sense for companion animal behaviour issues in Perth, Western Australia. She's been a member of staff at Murdoch University University Veterinary School since 2017, teaching clinical behaviour medicine to undergraduate veterinary students. She loves to pass on knowledge to others through presenting and using case studies to illustrate the enormous array of behaviour problems and their various treatment protocols. She is passionate about educating others on the need for kind, scientifically sound ways to change behaviour. At the heart of her work is a goal for increased empathy between humans and the animals with whom we share the world. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to welcome Nicole back to the show today. Nicole, thank you so much for taking even more time to come and hang out with us at Animal Training Academy. Thanks, Ryan. Good to be here. Now, if you listening haven't already listened to part one, I highly encourage you to do so. You can find it as the previous episode to this one in whatever app you're listening to this on. Uh, In that episode, we had a great time learning about Nicole's journey from where she first started up until now, 2023, as well as all the fantastic projects and endeavors she's been involved in over the years. However, if you haven't listened to it, no worries. You are, of course, totally welcome to stay tuned into this episode and what will be an equally excellent conversation where today I'm super excited to talk about collaborations, which are so important for us that specialize in behavior modification. With multiple levels of analysis, we need to build a team where we have subject matter experts with different skill sets and knowledge that we can call on to help us with the animals we work with. And for those of us specializing in training and especially helping clients, one really important relationship we need to build is with our vets. Having multiple vets we can ask for help from and refer to is super valuable. And on top of that, vets that specialize in certain areas, including behavior vets. And so I'm really excited about today's episode because I think it's going to be so valuable in helping to develop strong and beneficial relationships. Nicole, you have kindly put together for us a list of five things you would like trainers to know about working with veterinarians who specialize in behavior. Can you get us started, please, with number one? Yeah, okay. So the first thing I I had on my little list was that incorporating the veterinary behaviorist wasn't the last resort. Um, and we did touch on that last episode. Uh, the, reason, the reason being that the, the quicker you treat the animal, the quicker you get a, a response. And that is just that that can be about training as well, because that's about not allowing practice and rehearsal of behavior. So when as veterinary behaviorists, we, we consider that we have four areas that we deal with. So we've got management, modifying, medication and monitoring. So obviously everybody, including the trainer, can get involved in, in what management looks like. 
like. Um, and that's, you know, again, another area that if that is begun as early as possible, it results in the in the best response, right? Because the earlier that, that animals are managed well, the less time they spend practicing those behaviors that we don't want. So, I mean, everybody can get involved in management and, you know, people can be underwhelmed by good management. They can think, oh, well, I'm a, it's only better because I'm managing it better. And they can feel that that's not really success. But we put, we put a lot of stock in good management. So um, not being a last resort is often in reference to incorporating medicines. They want to, they want to leave medicine out as long as possible. But I guess, you know, Know, as far as we're concerned as veterinary behavior uh, veterinary behaviorists we we actually want to use all three methods management modifying and medicating as efficiently as possible together all at the same time to get the the best response as quickly as possible so I mean there's actually quite a lot of studies that that um, that go back quite a long time now that will will show you that if you incorporate, say, for instance, I'm thinking of an old study where they incorporated the use of fluoxetine for separation anxiety. Those animals that had the true medication as as opposed to the sugar pill, they had a 80% quicker improvement in response than behavior modification alone. So, you know, in my mind, there's an ethical, there's an ethical reason to, to put the best plan together, right? Because because you're reducing the the length of time that it takes for that animal to respond to the treatment plan. So yeah, last resort is is something that I will try to um, you know change if that's if that's the opinion of of the person or the client. Um, yeah, definitely. Cool. Thank you. I hadn't thought about those four components of any okay. behavior change. Okay. I like it. They all start with M. It's easy to remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Management, yeah. modifying, medicating, and, and monitoring. Yeah. I mean, we used to have the three Ms um, without the monitoring, but obviously monitoring is so important because if, if if you're not doing that, if you're not rechecking and and assessing, well, is this plan working if you set and forget then um, you know it, go, it can go off the rails pretty pretty easily. So we've added the the monitor <laughs> as and we we try and keep really close track on our clients. I mean uh, our trainers are, are actually hand holding more than us if you like if you if you see what I mean because they the trainers might be seeing the client more frequently than the vet behaviorists. But we're still um, keeping track of of the whole thing. Um, I don't know if you've had a look, but you'll see that if you if you're a follower of Animal Sense on Facebook or Instagram, you'll see that some of our clients are our clients that we've had for years. And so, um, you know, we're like the oil change <laughs> and full service every six months. I mean, we might have got to 70% improvement in, in our behavior um, treatment. And that's usually where our goal is, at least 70% improved from first being seen. And yet we're still seeing them three or four years on, and that's because we're 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 making sure that life and and disease and and health and all of those things don't change in a way that negatively impact on behaviour. So some of our clients who are whose maybe initial behaviour problems and are kind of I want to say fixed. I'm not usually using that word, but are, are treated in the in the most successful way. They'll still be patients of animal sense because um, we 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 recognise that over time life and disease and and things change that might impact behaviour in another way and so we'll make adjustments to the plan as years go on. Yeah. So your job as as a trainer, whether you're experienced or just getting started your job's going to be different if you're experienced your job is to have developed the skills to know the difference between how, how would you describe it when, when is the point that the in your words trainer should call you so I've, I'm going to see a client there there is this learner this dog who 
is behaving abnormally, we have the skills to tell the difference between that. How, how, in your words, how do you describe that point where the client yeah. said, the, the trainer who has a client says, we need to call up Nicole? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that is my second point on here on my little oh, list great of five minds things think trainers alike, should know. Nicole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ryan, you're spot on here. So I've got number two is the difference between a training problem versus mental illness. That's what I wrote. So, um, so I guess I would, if I'm the trainer, if I was the trainer. I would be asking myself, looking at the dog, is this an animal that can learn? So, you know, how quickly does this animal get hold of the concept that I'm asking it to do and be able to perform it? And and obviously there'll be there'll be different, you know, you'll have a different learning history, you know, so some animals might be fr- <laughs> frightened of getting it wrong through past punishment or whatever. And so we have not a very enthusiastic learner, but, you know, know there's a difference between the dog that hasn't had the opportunity and quickly works out you know oh yeah I can I can do this I'm motivated I've you know the trainers found that what motivates the dog and the dog starts to to operate right versus the dog that as as the trainer through reading the body language and and doing all the things appropriately to make the dog feel safe still doesn't feel safe so a big one for me would be a dog that startles so the dog that you flick your piece of paper on your on your on your flipboard or whatever or you're talking to the client and you move your hand and the dog is is under the table um those those kind of animals that are, that are startling to benign noise um, or movement or showing a lot of uh, stress responses, you know, body language stress responses, yawning, lip licking. Um, maybe it's a frantic friend maker. Maybe it's showing excessive ap- appeasal. Um, all of those signs that suggest that I'm living in a state of fear and anxiety that isn't appropriate for the context. Um, And the clients might tell you through the history, you know, oh, when I load the dishwasher, the dog is out of the kitchen. It can't handle the cutlery noise. Um, Gee, that's a bit weird, you know. (laughs) Um, I get my phone out and the dog is chasing the reflection reflections from the phone as it hits the ceiling hmm. you know so so if if there's things that 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 i guess are suggestive to me that the brain isn't working properly um and that is by looking at, at behaviors that are either too intense to that happen too frequently um that happen for too long so say something uh, uh you drop a bowl and the bowl breaks okay everybody could be a little bit unsure about that but this dog goes and hides for the next three hours under the bed you know though if if we've got things like that in our history and i i suspect that trainers are collecting that kind of history as well um as a as a vet behaviorist might um then then those things are suggestive of a brain that is experiencing stress at a level that will make any behavior modification that you try and do much more difficult and slow and obviously if it's too slow then you start to lose the client right because the client's really struggling with seeing any success and and obviously people people need reinforcement don't they they need to feel that they are achieving so sometimes that that's how we're we're using medication we're using medication in a way to allow the client to have more success and therefore be more motivated to continue on with the dog so this so number two I don't know what words you used, mm. but I'm going to have a, I'm the gonna dif- have a The dif- Ooh, you say, difference. Yes. The difference between training problems uh, versus mental between, illness. Between training problems and mental illness. So the yeah. skill becomes known the difference between or, or knowing to look for an individual learner that's living in a state of fear and anxiety that isn't appropriate for the content. Yes. So if you are yes. listening to the show... 
and you've been training for one or two years and you haven't had a mentor to guide you, you've done some courses and you've just started taking clients and, and you're, you're questioning your ability to make those judgment calls and make those decisions and whether you have what it takes to be a trainer and imposter syndrome, all of these mm. things that are commonly described and talked about within our industry. What do you, what do you have to share to mm. those younger trainers mm. to, mm. When, when do they, how do they make that call? When do they, what are your thoughts? Yeah, well, we do, um, we do help lots of younger trainers actually as well in our local vicinity because if they if they do have this dog that they you know maybe it's the first dog they've come across that they feel falls out of their normal clientele where they are recognizing oh gee this dog is is maybe a candidate for a veterinary behaviorist uh, consult as well as my help I mean we would have those trainers attend um with their client and uh, that's available to all our clients to to attend with the trainer and obviously that can be if you're a new trainer that can obviously be a really valuable part of your learning to sit in with the with the client in the veterinary um, behavior consult because um, you're both getting the same information but also you know I mean I have very experienced trainers who who also sometimes sit in and come with their clients because you you know they they are there to I guess we're there to support each other so sometimes um sometimes you know it could be a case where the trainer the trainer ha- wants my support you know like wants want maybe they haven't been able to um adequately get maybe the client to to change something that they're doing and and therefore you know th- another voice you know we can support each other with that I mean it's very you would obviously have talked about this a lot on your shows you know about how it's important to to have a client come on the journey with you you know it's not a and and often if clients have maybe been down a a more quick fix aversive pathway and now they're seeking your help and they've changed tax and they have a positive reinforcement trainer or or maybe they don't even know these terms even um but they they they're still maybe attached to some of their tools you know they do come into animal sense sometimes with with shock collars and and prong collars and and all of that kind of stuff and you're like oh whoa <laughs> uh we're a bit we we want to get rid of that but at the same time we've got to be aware that we need need to not make a person feel ashamed of of what they've done or um you know critical we can't be critical of them when they're basically there trying to do the best for their dog and they they may have been given information that that this was going to help and uh we need to educate them in in a very kind and um positive way so that they can they can help their dog but sometimes i mean obviously trainers who are very passionate naturally about positive reinforcement can um need some help trying to get that balance right in terms of not being overly critical of the client and then losing the client so sometimes I think they use us in that way (laughs) because we can be the ones that that help them um educate the client on why we might want to get rid of a tool that they've become reliant on but actually is not helping us in in the long term yeah cool I didn't think about that Mm. element Mm. of them reaching out to it on at those stages where they may be uncertain to gain that experience. That's cool. That was number two, knowing the difference between a behavior problem and mm. mental health problem. What's number three, Nicole? Yeah. So number three. So my third point was, and it does probably sound a bit from a bit similar, is that stress impairs learning. So what I had written down here was that a best the best dog trainer in the world couldn't achieve success if the dog cannot listen. So again, this was about um, understanding the difference between, say, f- your frantic friend maker and a happy dog. <laughs> <laughs> um that's a that's a big one I think even for veterinarians you know I read it in 
in vet vet history notes a lot. Oh, dog is very exuberant. Dog is very boisterous. Dog is very um, excited. And what what's been missed here is that the dog is in a state of over arousal again when the context, the brain should have assessed the context and gone. You know what? This is boring. I can I can lie down now. You know I can I can chill. When those when when that's not possible for that animal through so we see the stress signs as either over arousal or aggression or avoidance or even inhibited shut down um if we're se- if we're seeing any of those dogs in a context where the dog should feel safe then we know that it's going to have difficulty learning and therefore we can do things to assist the learning state i mean the one of the things that i think most people don't understand about um, serotonin medications is that they're not magic pills. <laughs> um, they're not very quick in their action and they're not, and they're quite subtle, I suppose, in the way that they allow the brain to be improved. I mean, serotonin is a, is a, is a, neurochem- a neurochemical that is present in large areas, in, in many, many areas of the brain, but one of the areas that we're most interested in in behavior is improving the pathways between the prefrontal cortex, which is right behind your thick front area of the skull, and your reactive brain, which is your more primitive emotional brain. Um, and it's increasing the level of serotonin in those pathways that allows more emotional control. So so serotonin, if you think about it, um, as a kind of handbrake on emotional responses. Um, if you think about it in that way, it allows that learning and that thinking, that cognitive area of the brain to take control over an emotional response. I sometimes say to vet students, it's that thing that stops you hitting the person that pulled out in front of you in the road rage, right? You know, if you have good emotional control, you don't get into a fisty cuff with a with another road user right but if if you if you've got poor levels of emotional control it's quite easy to get over aroused aggressive and kind of non-thinking in your in your response so um the the going back to the stress impairs learning is that serotonin when you elevate that serotonin it allows for all these like little receptors to be enhanced in number on the hippocampus, which is an area of the brain that is important in learning, associational learning. So that sit, stay on your bed, all of that kind of learning, which we really want our dogs to be good at. Well, that area of the brain is damaged when cortisol is in excess. Cortisol is a stress hormone. And what serotonin does is allow for more receptors for cortisol on the hippocampus. So this is getting to the crux of if the if there's lots of serotonin there's lots of cortisol receptors in the learning and memory areas of the brain and that that's how serotonin protects the learning so so you can see how that is actually quite um, a roundabout way of protecting the brain and making a better learner it's not and it's actually that's why it's reasonably slow as well like you know we say when we start at SSRI on a dog, we're waiting for six to eight weeks to begin the 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 real the really more noticeable positive effects from the medication because it's actually we're waiting for the architectural change in the number of 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 receptors um, that can mop up the cortisol and therefore allow the the memory and the learning to stick better. I don't think I've ever <laughs> tried to explain this myself so I'm going to try to explain mm-hmm. what you just said back to you <laughs> and you can fill okay. in the gaps and I, I, think it'll be, <clears throat> I think it'll be helpful for our listeners so that they sure. can hear the information a couple of times so <clears throat> firstly let's start with Number three being stress and peers learning. Mm-hmm. Serotonin is a neurochemical that is present in many areas of the brain, 
Uh, and when we, what one thing it does is communicate between the prefrontal cortex and your, is it your amygdala, your amygdala? Yeah, your yeah, amygdala, yeah, in the, in the uh, limbic area. In the yep. limbic area. Um, and we want to increase the level of serotonin in those pathways. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like putting a handbrake on emotional responses. Mm. And the SSRI, is it? Mm-hmm. So that's called, that's a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor so basically it's it's elevating the amount of serotonin that stays in that synaptic space between neurons and therefore that neuron then fires more so I, I like to think of it as we've turned that track that was like a dirty little one one horse track between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala into a super lane five lane highway now that we have <laughs> <laughs> more serotonin. I, I mean, I like to think of it like that. I'm not sure if that's a good analogy, but that's how my brain um, kind of perceives it as happening, that now we have much more feedback available to our emotional brain from our higher centers, yeah, to say, you know what, that's not that scary. Or you know what, I can go and lie down over there while there is a visitor in the house. And and so you talked about receptors on the hippocampus yes so remind me how that tied into it yeah so so we think about um so the hippocampus is another area of the emotional brain so another area in the limbic system but it's it's very much involved in associational learning which means that kind of learning that allows you to remember calm and to be functional i suppose whereas your amygdala is more emotional memory um and threat responses. Hippocampus, you need your hippocampus to be working well to do the things that your caregiver asks you to do. (laughs) And your hippocampus is directly and negatively affected by the firing of the amygdala because it's then when the amygdala fires, cortisol is released, which is a stress hormone, and it's the cortisol that damages the hippocampus. But the hippocampus can protect itself through having cortisol receptors, if you like, and those are stimulated to be more abundant under the influence of more serotonin. So there's a there's a there's a chemical called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, and that is stimulated by to be in a larger amount because of serotonin. And it's the brain-derived neurotrophic factor that allows for uh, a better connection between those areas of the brain. I mean, it, and I, you know, I don't describe any of this to clients either. <laughs> so uh, we're probably getting into an area that, it, you know, it's not necessary for anybody as a trainer to know this. Um, but obviously, you know, knowing it, and if you have an interest in 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 a deeper understanding, um, yeah, it's great. But I mean, what what I feel like it's important to recognise or to know as cl- as trainers and even as veterinarians um, imparting the material to your clients is that ha- the 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 major effect of something like an SSRI is to protect the brain from stress. So if you recognise recognize that an animal is stressed that's all you need to do right that it's a stressed and therefore an a, a incapable of learning to the full degree then yes it could benefit from something that protects the brain from stress what protects the brain from stress well there's good diet there's omega-3 there's ssris there's management you know there's avoidance there's 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 more things obviously than than just medication but medication could be part of that plan and we know uh very much so from there's there's many um there's many experiments and and um literature that supports this that the SSRI uh, improves the animal in the in that you can see that an animal that has had the benefit of the SSRI now recovers much quicker so that's something that clients report quite quickly that oh you know uh 
yes, he's still triggered by, say, seeing another dog at 20 metres, but he can look at me, take food, move on, and is back to sniffing in a very short period of time where he used to maybe, you know, that would be the end of the walk or something, or, you know, we wouldn't be able to keep going if we saw another dog or so you know the ability of the brain to recover after having experienced the trigger appears to be much better when the animal is on the on the SSRI and that's because there's an increase in serotonin which <clears throat> has which means that the cortisol receptors there's more cortisol receptors on the hippocampus which can absorb the cortisol better and faster yes. Yes, so to 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 yeah to to shorten the the negative effect, I guess. Yeah. <clears throat> All of the learning I did from Sal Bio One Hundred and One at university yes. is, is <clears throat> flooding back to me now. <laughs> yes, great. Yes, yeah, so you you remembered the synapse. <laughs> yeah, well, I've I've done my degree is in biology, so I'm curious for those mm. who haven't got that learning history of if they are yes. as aware of what we're talking about with receptors and. Yes. Yes, I know, and and uh, we're probably presuming a lot of maybe we're presuming a lot of already knowledge here in the talking of it, and uh, we could go back several steps but we might have to do another whole podcast on, <laughs> yeah, on a, that <laughs> a, 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 it's making sense to me apologies if, if we've lost some people um but if you're still mm, with us great we'll hope, move on hope, we'll move on hope. to number four <laughs> Yeah, good. Okay, so my number four was, and this is probably really relevant, especially once you start working with a veterinary behaviourist and you feel like, oh, you're beginning to understand the meds a little bit more. And then you might find yourself saying to a client, oh, your dog needs fluoxetine (laughs) or something like that. I would avoid doing that um, as a trainer because Actually, there is no cookie cutter, I would say, cookie cutter approach. Um, I'm really, really happy for trainers to say, I think your dog needs to see the vet or vet behaviourist, but I would caution against recommending certain medication, perhaps because you've seen it used before and it was successful. Because certainly what I know um, over doing this for a long period of time and treating thousands of dogs with medication is that that just because one dog did well on one SSRI doesn't mean that another one will. And sadly, that's the individual response to medication, which means that, I mean, we're just guessing really what's going on in the brain in terms of the individual. And so when we add an SSRI to an individual, we can actually get a variety of responses, including I look worse. (laughs) So um, that's a big part of veterinary behaviour medicine is knowing what to look for in terms of worse. It's actually not hard, is it, usually, to know it looks worse. Um, But knowing then what to do when it is worse. Um, Sometimes it does take us... uh, uh, m- much longer than we had hoped to find the right medical intervention for a particular individual. Um, and, you know, this happens in humans as well, obviously, and that's why there are many SSRIs um, because because they're, they have different side effect profiles um, and for individuals they, 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 they actually are different because they... They affect different 5-HT receptors, which there are a number of. And so even though their base effect is still to elevate the serotonin, they are affecting different receptors. And so there's just nuances between them. <clears throat> but for individuals, um, a med can feel miraculous. And then for the next animal, that same med can, can do nothing. Um, and so... I think it's not till you get into having treated lots and lots of animals do you start to see the whole range of of different things that the meds might do that that you weren't aware of. Um, And sometimes they can produce the direct opposite thing to what you want. So you do have to be prepared to stop meds um, very quickly sometimes and you also have to be... um, 
aware of all the other meds that the dog obviously might be on for whatever other reason because there's lots of things that can't be easily combined with each other. Is, is that something you've come across, trainers coming to you and saying, Nicole, I am, I'm here to tell you that I brought you this dog and I think it needs uh, this particular drug. Yes. Well, I, I certainly have had um, individuals who, for whatever reason, um, you know, my neighbour's dog is on this and, and I've been given this and I want what my neighbour's dog has got because <laughs> their dog's really good now. Or do you know what I mean? Like just a, just a lack of understanding um, as to, 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 you know, and it's, it's easy for, for people to look at one animal that's responded really well to a med and therefore want that med. But, you know, you just, there isn't, um, that that's not science. Uh, it sadly doesn't doesn't work like that so yeah and I mean mostly most dogs that have a behavior issue sorry I've got a tickle in my throat <coughs> most dogs that um, have a behavior issue will have a baseline medication such as an SSRI because of what we talked about with protecting learning but that might not be the only med they have so if they if they suffer from significant over arousal they might have other meds to control those impulses so it can become quite complicated um, when we're using more than one med, but often the clients that we have are in a serious state of um, distress by the time they come to see us. And sometimes we need more than one med because we can't just wait for the SSRI to take effect. We might need something more rapid than that. And so there'll be, they'll, you know, we we might have um, a multi multiplicity of meds that we're doing a polypharmacology <laughs> kind of on the animal to 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 put them in a in a better state uh, more quickly than waiting for the SSRI to work, and then we'll be subtracting meds as as improvement then occurs. But and so that's why, um, yeah, I think as trainers, you you you're very well versed. In, in your ability to recommend that there might be a, a, a need for a medication plan, but but I would uh, suggest staying in, in your lane <laughs> in regards to choosing those meds. So be, be, feel free to say, I think your dog might need to be medicated, but then just leave it at that. <laughs> So number one is don't leave it too late to talk to a behaviour vet. Number two is knowing the difference between a behaviour problem and mental health. And we're talking about five things that you want trainers to know when working with a behaviour vet. Number three is that stress impairs learning. And we talked a lot about what that actually looks like if we were able to see inside the brain. Uh, number four is as a trainer, stick to your lane. It's funny that you should say that at the end because that's how I wrote it down on my patty. One more. What is your number five, please, Nicole? Yes. So the last one <clears throat> um, is that people people will have their own bias and, and they, you know, so if, I mean, I will get clients, for instance, who uh, have a negative bias towards medication and then um. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, make them <laughs> use medication. That wouldn't be possible anyway um, on their dog. And and then we wouldn't get good compliance. Um, it, and I'm never going to abandon them um, because they don't choose to use medication on their dog. What I would do, um, and this has happened, you know, numerous times where we, we begin the work without the medication and, and again, because we're monitoring in three months' time, if we haven't achieved the progress that we want with the behaviour modification, I'm going to bring it up again. Would Would you like to have a look and see if we can do this better with the addition of a med? And if that usually they have a specific um, concern over the med, you know, one of the common things I'm sure you would have heard is that, you know, I don't want my dog to be a zombie. And you know what? Either do I. <laughs> That's the last thing I want. So, so I want the dog to be the best dog it can be. And I don't want it to appear doped or drugged or, um, you know, in any, in any way less of itself. Um, I want to enhance the ability it has to, to be the best dog it can be. And I think when people understand that, that SSRIs don't dope their dog, they shouldn't be producing lethargy. They, um, 
they they will sleep well, but usually prior to the SSRI, they haven't been sleeping well. So, you know, like they've been getting up at night, they've been moving around, they've been, you know, half asleep, they, they startle a lot when they're, when they're woken, they don't dream as much as they should. Um, those, so they might sleep better, but that when they're awake, they are, uh, you know, lively and all the, all the normal things that they normally would be without the level of stress signs. So, you know, sometimes it's important, um, to really drill down on what it is that the people are worried about. If they, if they are concerned about meds, are they worried what are the side effects that they're worried about? If we see, we don't really put up with any side effect. Anything that the client doesn't like um, will cause us to stop the med and and reconsider the use of it because the client has to be um, on board fully and happy and compliant with using the med for the med to, to make a difference. Um, so you know, like we're happy to to work through that with the with the client. And sometimes I'm thinking of a client specifically now that was quite reluctant to use medication for maybe the first six months of the treatment. Then then began very conservatively, still below effective dose for quite a while, and eventually it took a while to get onto the right dose and. Once was on the right dose was was <laughs> was turned into the client of what else can she have you know <laughs> this is great my God you know so I think once people realise that we're not um, making their animal you know less of itself uh, they 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 can they 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 can really come on board and and see that we're actually making a positive change in the dog's life because no one if you imagine yourself as in the animal's body and if you are living in a state of anxiety and that can be alleviated then then that's really the 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 ethical choice and the best welfare choice is to allow that dog to to live its its best life with the least stress yeah well thank you for sharing those five things just to recap everyone we were talking about five things that nicole would like trainers to know about working with vets who specialize in behavior number one don't leave it too late to talk to a behavior vet uh, number two, knowing the difference between a behavior problem and mental health problem. Number three, stress and peers learning. Number four, as a trainer, stick to your lane. Uh, number five, people will have their own biases. So you, you have to work with clients in approximations based on the individual client you're working with. That's how I interpreted that one. Yeah, yeah, great. Once again, thanks so much for sharing everything today, Nicole. Uh, sadly this does bring us to the end of part two but we have one more question for you i'm just curious okay. if you could take us into the future what would you like to see happen over the next five mm. to ten years in, in the animal training world but also in the animal training or animal trainers collaborating with veterinary behaviors behaviorists behavior vets what do you, what do you want to see happen yeah. in, in this space over the next five to ten years yeah well, I'd love trainers to be on board in, in veterinary hospitals as part of the veterinary team. Um, you know, wouldn't it be great if every veterinary hospital had a trainer as part of their their employed staff that, that took kind of control over um, the animal handling aspects, um, helped clients learn how to do cooperative care with their with their own animals and how to also train the veterinary staff in the handling to to produce the the least stress in the vet clinic you know and then you know you wouldn't have clients going outside of that system to 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 training um, regimes that that we know are, are detrimental to the to the mental state of the patient. Um, you know, sadly, not enough uh, veterinarians or vet pra- practices do have a good understanding of of the type of training that 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 is best for the animal, and sometimes are recommending things like boot camps and stuff like that 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 we know actually make our job much harder in recovering these animals yeah I'd never no one's ever said that before imagine if we had a trainer employed at every vet clinic 
That would be amazing. I would feel like I would travel mm. a long way to go to that vet clinic. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, you know, you, you could have your little training consults, you know, say the veterinarian's worked out that this dog's going to need ear medication and that's probably going to be an ongoing thing for the, you know, for the lifetime of the dog. Okay, so let's go. We're going to book you in with Ryan to get him to start to teach you about how you can be doing cooperative care ear treatment so that, you know, this is not something that's going to get worse and worse over time and end up needing sedations and all the rest just to get a look down the dog's ear. Well, I hope yeah, that we're there. You'd have a very big full day, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Very full. Um, just before we do officially wrap up, Nicole, can you just remind mm. everyone listening where they can go to find out more about you, what you do, and get in touch? Yes. So we're Animal Sense, A N I M A L S E N S E dot com dot A U. And we're in Perth, Western Australia. And we'd love you to have a look at our website. Fantastic. And we will, of course, link to the website on the show notes as well as Animal Sense and Nicole's social media. Nicole, this has been so much fun from myself and on behalf of everyone listening. We really appreciate you taking the time to come on the show today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ryan. We do, of course, really appreciate all of you tuning in today as well. And if you have enjoyed this episode and you were interested in carrying on the conversation about working with our animals in the most positive, funnest, choice-rich ways, then as mentioned at the start of this episode, the Animal Training Academy community is waiting for you. Head on over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com and click on the membership button in the main menu. To learn more about what members are describing as the Netflix social media platform for behaviour geeks. That's it for this episode though. We're going to wrap it up there. Thanks again so much everyone for listening. You'll hear from us again soon. Listener.